Thank you so much for inviting me to this beautiful country. We came in yesterday and as we flew into Queenstown, it was such a glorious sight. And I come from sunny Queensland. <laughs> and all the Queenstown was cold, but it is so pretty. It, it compensates for the cold, yeah. And um, I, I seen snow once in Melbourne, that was uh, about 27 years ago. I, but there was a blizzard there, so we didn't really enjoy the snow. But as the plane was coming into Queenstown, I looked at this beautiful snow-covered mountains, and I said, Lord, how can people say there is no God? When you look at God's creation, how can one say that there is no God? I mean, just by His spoken word, those beautiful mountains came into being. And, and the same God that created those lovely mountains, He also covered it with that beautiful snow. And then you look at the lake out here, what a glorious sight. I've seen pictures of this in, in magazines, in postcards, or sometime on the TV, but I've never really seen it with my own eyes. And I, I'm so glad for this privilege that God has given me that I can see it. And to share it with you beautiful ladies. Yeah, I just want to give God all the praise, the glory, and the honor. Now let me tell you something. I am not a preacher. By <laughs> In the natural, I was a school teacher. But God took me out of that when he healed me. On the 25th of September this year would be 25 years since the Lord healed me. But that testimony is going to be shared at an, one of the other meetings. So I'm not going to share that today. But I just want to give God all the praise, the glory, and the honor. 25 years ago, I would have been dead. But he, I am here today by His grace and His mercy. And it's not anything that I have done, but because of His immeasurable grace that I am here today. And I just want to give Him all the thanks and all the praise and the glory and the honor. And uh, what I'm going to share with you today, I am, like I said, I'm not a preacher. But God gave me this word uh, some time ago, and I thought, Lord, I need to share it with as many as I can. And um, I heard about the saying many, many years ago, when I was still in school, I think I heard this adage says that obedience is better than sacrifice. I'm sure all of you have heard that. It wasn't, I mean, while I was in school, I, I heard about this, and I didn't. At that time, I was not a Christian, so I didn't know that it was from the Word of God. I was born into a staunch Hindu family, and that too, I will share, I will share that with you tomorrow. I was born into a staunch Hindu family, and the Lord found us. We didn't find Him. Like the Word says, He found us that while we were sinners, He died for us. And Christ came into our home in 1974 when the Lord healed my dad. I'll share with that tomorrow. But while I was in school, I, I, I heard this, or we were taught this, that obedience is better than sacrifice. And uh, we were asked to write a composition or something about this, and we went around. But years later, after I got saved and reading the Word of God, I came across this. I said, so this is where the teachers took this from. And I found out that it was taken from... 1 Samuel chapter 12. And this was when King Saul, God had commanded King Saul to utterly destroy the Amalekites. I'm sure you all would know that. I just want to refresh your memory. When Israel, uh, sorry, when God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, they had encountered the Amalekites. And the Amalekites had treated them very, very badly. And God was patient with the Amalekites, but after a while, he got tired with them. And he, he commanded King Saul, he said, I want you to go and utterly destroy the Amalekites. Now, he, he used the word utterly destroy, and that means totally destroy them. Get rid of them completely, not only the people, but also everything that they possessed. And this was God's commandment. He said, utterly destroy them. But as we continue reading in 1 Samuel chapter 15, you find that after Saul had killed the Amalekites, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't follow God's commandment because God said, utterly destroy it. And he got, when God says something, he always says it for a purpose. 
And yet he told them to utterly destroy the Amalekites. And Saul, he killed, he killed most of them. All that was rubbish and the trash, he destroyed it. But he took the very best, the very best of the cattle. And after he killed the people, he took, he took their king as captive. And he also took the spoil, the best of the spoils as well. He took it for himself. And that's, that's going totally against God's word because God said, totally destroy them. And here we find Samuel, uh, sorry, King Saul d disobeyed God. Now we find that the first act of disobedience, many of us think the first act of disobedience took place in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve disobeyed God. But no, it didn't take place there. The first act of disobedience took place in heaven. It took place in heaven. There were three archangels, Gabriel, Michael, and Lucifer. They were the three archangels in heaven. And Lucifer's job, he was in charge of worship. He was all the musical instruments and he would lead the worship in heaven. But there came a day when pride filled Lucifer. And that's where we get another English saying, pride comes before the fall. You all heard that? Pride comes before the fall. And that's where it started. It started in heaven. When, when Lucifer, th that time his name was Lucifer, when he was an archangel, he, it, pride filled him up so much because he was doing his job so beautifully and worship was so lovely in heaven. And he said, I want to become like the Most High God. Pride filled him. Now nobody can become like the Most High God. We all strive to become like God. We want to become more and more like God. Not become like Him in the natural, but become, have God's ways in us. That's what we strive. This is the, the life that we put on this earth for, to become more and more like God. But Lucifer wanted to dethrone God and he wanted to become like God. And pride filled him. And what happened to him? He was demoted. He was kicked out of heaven, and that's why he, together with one-third of the angels, are roaming this world today. They go to and fro on the earth, and Lucifer now has become Satan. He's become the god of this age. And because he was kicked out of heaven, now we are God's most prized possession. If you didn't know that, I'm telling you, you are God's most prized possession because he created you in his image. None of the other things that he created is in his image, but you and I, human beings, were created in God's image and we are his joy. And when we come before him, he looks at us with joy because he made us like him. And we give him so much pleasure. And I know each one of you that is a parent yet today, your children must have given you so much of joy and pleasure, just like God created us to give him pleasure. But when our children disobey us, we feel hurt within ourselves. We feel, we really feel it inside. And the same thing with God as well. When, when we as his children disappoint him or hurt him, he feels it. But you know, he's so forgiving. When we come and confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. And he said in, in his word, he said, no matter though your sins be as scarlet, he will make us whiter than snow. Now where can you find someone that is as our God, that can cleanse us? And he also says that as far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgression. And more than that, he remembers them no more. Now what a loving God, what a mighty and awesome God He is that no matter how bad your sin is, He can forgive it and He will remember them no more. Now that is the, the God that you and I serve. You know, I come out of Hinduism and we did a lot of, lot of blood sacrifices, a lot of Hindu rituals, and we did it to appease or find favor with our gods. We had so many gods, we had thousands of gods. And we had to offer all these sacrifices to these gods to appease them and to find favor with them. And sometimes it worked, but most of the time it didn't work. And, and the so-called gods, it's small letter gods. The god that I serve now is the god with a capital G. The, the gods that I used to serve is the gods with a small g. Those are the gods, the god of this age. 
And most of the time, the things that we prayed to them, it didn't work. But I'm so glad that God found us in 1974. And, and it, it's been a glorious time ever since. It hasn't been easy because like someone says, in, in, with a, in a rose bush, you don't only get roses, you get thorns as well. But you look at the beauty of the rose and it overcomes the thorns. So it, it, the life that we had was not, as, not an easy life, but God has been with us all the way because He's the God of His Word. And if you stand on the Word of God, the God of the Word will stand by you. Because that's His promise to us that He will never leave us, He will never forsake us, and neither will He fail us. And it's, if, if anything happens and if we fail, it's because of our own doing, not because of God. Because He is the God of His Word. Now when Satan was kicked out of heaven together with one third of the angels, and those fallen angels are what are demon spirits today. And sadly in Hinduism, we used to worship those demon spirits and we call them gods because we didn't know any better. But after coming out of, God took us out of the heathen darkness and he showed us this glorious light. Now we can understand those demon spirits that we worshipped. And they were those fallen angels. And a lot of people, there's millions of them out there today still worshipping them. And that is why we pray. And that is why we're doing what we are doing today. Because how will they know unless we go and tell them? And I believe God, God healed me 25 years ago for us to do what we're doing today. Because ever since Jesse and I have given up the work that we used to do and the business that we had, we have seen countless number of people come out of the kingdom of darkness when they find this glorious light. They find this marvelous, loving God that you and I serve today. And um, some of you might not understand it, but some of you are just born in a Christian home. That's all you know is Christ. But when you come out of darkness serving these, these so-called demon spirits and you come into this glorious light, you know the difference. You know what it is to be in darkness and you know what it is to come into this life. It is like scales have been removed from your eyes and you can see everything in a new light. And it's all because of what God has done in our lives. Now these fallen angels together with, with Lucifer who is now Satan, they roam this earth. And you can find that in the book of Job. Remember when, when the, the sons of God came before God and God asked them what they were doing, and, and Lucifer came with them as well. And God asked, where have you been? He said, I've been walking to and fro on the earth. And, and he said, I've seen your servant Job. And that's how all those tribulations came upon Job. But he said, Satan said it himself, I am walking to and fro up and down the earth. And what is he doing on this earth? He's not just walking and, and admiring those beautiful mountains like we are doing. Or, no, his job is like in Acts 10, uh, in, uh, uh, Acts 10 no, sorry, John 10.10. 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's what he's doing. He's going around the world seeing whom he can steal from, whom he can destroy, and whom he can kill. And like our sister gave that word today, wives, everyone, stand by your husbands because we're living in those very last days. And Satan is all out to destroy marriages. That's what he wants to do. And that's why the word came, wives, stand by your husbands. Because when you get married, you two become one. And Satan wants to divide because he has this, this principle, when you divide, you conquer. But when you're united, you can stand together. And you know, the number one cannot be divided by any by any number. If you divide one by one, you will still get one. And if and God put you together, that is why when you pray, if you pray with your husbands, it's so good because where two shall agree and ask anything in my name. That's why when he, when he had Adam on the earth, he, God, I think, looked at Adam and said, oh, it's not good for Adam to be alone. So he created a wife for Adam. And so Adam can agree with his wife and that whatever you ask, you shall get. So be encouraged with that word our dear sister gave there. So Satan goes about doing what he's doing and he loves doing it because he knows that when he steals, kills and destroys on this earth, he's causing grief to come upon God. But our God doesn't, doesn't have 
He, he wants to bring grief to God, but our God doesn't grieve because he's an almighty God. And he goes to, st to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And, and you hear the testament tomorrow when Jesse will share of how the Lord, I mean, the devil came to steal in our home that day. He was going to kill me. And today is, my son is 28 years old today, and he called us this morning to, because we left his present there to thank us. And I'm thinking, Lord, when my son was born 28 years ago, this was where everything started for us. I never realized it at that time, but for me to stand here and share, it all happened the day that he was born. And that was 28 years ago, but you'll hear more about that tomorrow. But what Satan does today, he goes about and he's, he's working overtime because he knows that his days are numbered. And he's, he's working overtime together with the host of those devils and demon spirits that he has to try and, and attack as many as he can. Remember, he's got the children of the world out there. They belong to him. And he's after God's children. So he goes about seeking whom he may destroy. And it's you and I that are his targets. So we have to be aware at all times that Satan is there wanting to attack us. And you know, the word of God tells us, if, if you have your Bibles, if you don't have it, you can write the scripture down and you can check it out later. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 and 15, Deceiving the world today. Okay, Second Corinthians chapter eleven, verse fourteen. Okay, let me read from verse thirteen. For such as such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves in th into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. We're living in the last days where one of the, the, the chief warnings that the Lord himself gave us, he said, be not deceived in the last days. The first thing he said, be careful, do not be deceived. And the scripture that I read to you now is Satan has ministers of himself, ministers of unrighteousness, masquerading as ministers of righteousness. So there's a lot of pastors and preachers out there that are put there by Satan himself and not ordained by God. So be careful who you listen to because in the last days, there's a lot of deception going out there. And the Lord himself said, by their fruit, you shall know them. Don't look at the outward of, of people, judge them by their fruit. And this is one of the, the first things in Matthew 24, Jesus himself said, in the last days, be careful for deception. And Satan is a master of disguise. He is a real master of disguise. And that's what he does today. He is trying as much as possible, the best that he can, to try and deceive people. And we as God's children should always be aware of the ploy of the enemy. We should be aware of the snares that he sets before us. And we, if we are really in tune with God's word and if we follow his commandments, then we will escape all the snare that the fowler lays before us. That's God's promise to us. But Satan goes about, he still goes and he does what he wants to do. And you find today, if you look at a, a lot of the preachers today, if you look at them and you see what they're preaching, you will know whether they are of God or not of God. And one of the, the things that Satan does, he, he got, got his preachers there that are teaching things contrary to God's word. Because remember, Satan was disobedient to God's word and he was kicked out of heaven. And he succeeded in deceiving 
the first couple that God put on earth, Adam and Eve. And if you look at what God said in His Word, He said, you can eat of every tree of the garden except that one tree that's in the middle of the garden. Do not eat that. But then when you go and you find when, when Satan came in the form of a serpent to, to Eve, and he said, he put doubt in, it, in her mind and he said, did God say this? Of course God said it. God said, you shall not eat of this. But he comes and he twists it around and he said, did God say this? And then she said, God said, I can eat of all these trees except the, that one. And what did he say? No, you will not die. Because God said, if you eat that, you're going to die. And he said, no, you shall not die, but you will become like God. And everybody wants to become like God. So what she did, she fell. The, the trap was set. She ate of that forbidden fruit. And you know the rest of what happened. Now Satan is still doing the same thing today. He's trying to put doubt in everyone's mind about God's word. And God has, has, has magnified his word above all his name. That's how important God's word is to us. In, in the Old Testament time, God spoke to his people through the prophets in, in, in olden times. But today, God is speaking to us through his word. And that is why it is so important for us to know what God is telling us into His Word. We need to study God's Word every day. And like the psalmist said, Thy Word have I hid in my heart that I will not sin against Thee. And if we have God's Word in us, no matter what Satan does, we know God's Word and we'll be able to fight him. Think about it. When Satan came to tempt Jesus, three times he came and tempted him. And how did Jesus overcomes Satan. He didn't fight him because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. But Jesus said, it is written. He overcame him all three times by the word of God. And that's the weapon that you and I have today. The word of God is the sword of the spirit. Now, the sword, you know what a sword is. A sword is some, a weapon that we use to fight. And in the olden days, they used to fight physically with the sword. But when we fight Satan... We fight him with the word. And if you don't have the word in your heart, you cannot fight him. Because he's very, very subtle. He's, he, he, he can transform himself. Although he's so full of unrighteousness, he transforms himself as if he is a minister of righteousness. And you can see a lot of ministers today that are leading people astray because they are preaching things contrary to God's word. And in the last days, in, uh, I come from South Africa and it's sad when I go back there, I know Jesse has a lot of pastors or friends of his that became pastors. And it's sad because a lot of them are preaching against the blood today. And I know and I still sing the song that there is power in the blood of Jesus. And it shall never ever lose its power. The blood of, of Christ still avails today. And no matter what your sins are, you can be a murderer, you can be a thief, no matter what you are. The blood of Christ still avails for you and I. And it will never, ever lose its power. But sad to say they're preaching against the blood today. They're preaching against communion today. I'm, I'm saying this to you because I need to warn you today. Because whatever happens in America will come to Australia. So it will come to New Zealand as well. They're preaching against the communion. And what did Jesus say in Corinthians when he gave out, uh, the Apostle Paul said, he said, as often as you eat this and you drink this, you do show it in remembrance of me. Now, if we don't take communion anymore, we're not remembering what Jesus did for us at the cross. But there are preachers today that are preaching against communion. They're not having communion anymore. And Jesus said, as often as you eat and drink this, you do show my death till he comes. So you can see those are preachers of unrighteousness. They are masquerading as ministers of righteousness. Also today, in this day that we are living in, in the, in the, in the Garden of Eden, when, or when God created Adam, or before you put them in the Garden of Eden, when God created Adam, he said it is not good for a man to be alone. So he put him to sleep and he created Eve, a wife for him. And in the beginning, he said, God created man and woman. And that was the first marriage that was ordained by God when God put man and woman together. But what's happening today? Man and man are getting married. And woman and woman are getting married. 
totally contrary to God's word. And sad to say, there are some ministers today that are agreeing with the so-called homosexual marriages. Ministers of unrighteousness. By their fruit you shall know them. And we also have ministers that, are, that do not have the guts to tell people they're living in fornication. De facto is a sugar-coated word for fornication and God hates that. God is a God of holiness and a God of righteousness and He hates sin. No matter what form it is, He hates it. And it's time for us as Christians to tell the world that this is the God that we serve. God made or instilled marriage in heaven between man and woman. We cannot allow our children to live in de facto because living in de facto might sin taste nice. It tastes nice for a short time. But the wages of sin is death. You cannot change God's word. If God says it, it shall come to pass. So we have to say it like it is today. We have to be truthful. We might, we might be persecuted for the gospel's sake, but Jesus said that is fine. He said for his name's sake, if we stand for his name, we will be persecuted. But we have to stand because there's no one else who's going to stand for him except those that truly love the word of God. And it's up to you and I to do it today. Then we find... It's so sad today, the fashion of this world. If some of you look at the fashion of this world, it is so bad. I mean, you, you see it in the church today that young women are coming half naked to church and there's nobody there to tell them this is wrong. God expects us to dress modestly and He put it down in His Word. And He said the fashion of this world will pass away, but His Word, not one jot nor one tittle of His Word shall pass away. And it's up to us now to, to try, and, uh, try and, and, and bring God's word back to where it was because there's power in his word. And it is up to us as mothers here to, to correct our young ones, our daughters, our granddaughters, to see that they dress modestly. But there are pastors today that are not saying anything against it. By their fruit you, they shall be known. An immodest dressing is totally out of God's will. He wants us to be modest. And you think about it, the fashion designers of this world, who are they? A lot of them are homosexuals. And they want to dress our daughters and our sons up. So it's up to us now to, to either we either stand on God's word, we either for him or we against him. Let's go back to King Saul. King Saul was disobedient to God's word when God said, destroy the Amalekites completely, utterly destroy them. And when, when the prophet Samuel came to correct him, what did he do? Samuel heard, Samuel, the prophet Samuel said, what is this? I can hear the bleating of the sheep. And when Saul realized that he was found out for what, what he had done wrong, and he realized that he had disobeyed God, he passed the buck onto the people. He started blaming. He said, no, it's the people that did that. And many of us today are in the same boat. If we do something wrong or we do something contrary to God's word and we get found out, we immediately started making excuses and we tried to put the blame on someone else. It's time that we take responsibility for our actions. And, and, and God... He's such a just God. He's so loving. Even though we make mistakes at times, He said if you confess your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us. He doesn't hold it against us. If we make a mistake and we say, Lord, we're sorry, we repent of it, He, he, he doesn't remember them anymore. And that's the God that you and I serve. And He loves us. That's the main, the most important thing is He loves us. And here was... The same thing that Saul did, he passed the buck onto the people, he blamed the people. You think of Adam and Eve in the garden. When God came to have fellowship with them, after they had eaten of the forbid, for yes, he did the same thing. He said, Adam said, uh, first Eve said, it's the serpent. And Adam said, it's the woman that you gave me. But they were not prepared to take the responsibility, the responsibility that they had done wrong. God would have forgiven, if, 
forgiven them if they admitted what they had done, but no, they passed the buck to each other. And the same thing is happening today in our world. You know it, if anybody does wrong, it is so hard for them to acknowledge that they have done wrong. And we also find, this, this is a very, very good scripture. I love this scripture. And it's one of Jesse's favorite scriptures. It's 1 Samuel 15, 23. We find that there's so much of disobedience in the world today. And disobedience leads to rebellion. And we find why is there so much of lawlessness in our, not, not only in our country, but in the world today. And Jesus said, in the last days, there'll be lawlessness. And we can see lawlessness coming because everything, Satan is doing everything possible to demean God's word, to bring it to null and void. But we know that there is life and there's only life in Christ Jesus. Let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23. When... when Saul disobeyed God's word and Samuel came there and he heard the bleating of the sheep and he asked Saul, what was this? And Saul passed the buck onto the people and Samuel was very, very upset and angry and he said, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as idolatry. There's a lot in that one little verse. If you sit and think about it, there's so much you can learn from that Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. If we rebel against God's word, it is as if we are practicing witchcraft. And God hates witchcraft. And stubbornness is as idolatry. King Saul was anointed by God to be king of Israel. But because of his rebellion and of his stubborn ways, he made himself an idol. It was everything about himself. He did this. And God is calling us to a spirit of meekness. He's calling us to a spirit of humbleness. And he said in his word, He that exalts himself shall be abased. But he that humbleth himself, God will exalt. And that's what God wants us. He wants us to be humble. And in due course, he will exalt us. But if we... Humble, uh, if we exalt ourselves like Satan, like Lucifer did, he exalted himself so much that he wanted to become like the Most High God. What happened to him? He was humiliated and kicked out of heaven. We don't want that. If you read in the, in the New Testament where God says, if you go to any place, sit at the lowest seat, that they will come and they will exalt you and put you into a higher place, rather than sitting on the highest seat and then they taking you down. That's, that's pretty demeaning. But God says He wants us He wants us to be humble. King Saul was a self-righteous man. He, he, everything was about himself. And he disregarded God's word. But God, he said, He has magnified His word even above all His names. God has so many names. Jehovah Jireh, God my provider. Jehovah Rapha, the God that healeth me. Jehovah Nissi, he has so many names, but he has, he has magnified his name, uh, sorry, his word above all these beautiful names that he has. And that's how important God's word is to us. And we have to take responsibilities for ourselves. If Saul took, his, took responsibility for his own actions, God would have forgiven him and God would have still kept given him the kingdom. But because of what he had done and his stubborn heart, the kingdom was removed from him and given to king, was given to David. David became king. But David, my son, we named him David. And I, Jesse wanted to call him Jonathan. And I wanted to call him David because David is the son of Jesse. We have only, we have, <laughs> we have two girls and one boy. And I said, I want David. So we kept both. We came to a compromise, so we call him David Jonathan. Yeah. And he's a lovely, lovely boy. He gives us a lot of joy as well. But if you look at the life of David, David was a little shepherd boy. 
and he, the Bible tells us that he was a man after God's own heart. I can imagine, when I, whenever I read about David, I think of my David. How much of joy my David brings to me. This little shepherd boy must have brought God so much of joy because he loved God. He was a man after God's own heart. And I think of David, before David went and faced Goliath. Goliath was this massive mountain or this massive thing that he had to conquer. But before he did that, he was faithful in the job that was entrusted to him. He was given like the menial job to go and tend for his father's sheep. While the other brothers who looked like kings, who dressed like kings, who walked like kings, they went to battle. God didn't choose the, any of them, but he chose David because he looked at the heart. He didn't look at the outward appearance. He didn't look at the stature. He didn't look at every, everything like we as humans are so good at doing. We judge by the outward appearance. But God looks at the heart of man. And in his word he tells us the heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know? I the Lord tried the reins. But I look at David on those hilltops tending the sheep there. And then the bear came. The bear came and attacked and took one of the little little lambs away from him. And what did David do? He left, the, he left all the other sheep there and he ran and he chased that bear. And when he got hold of him, he ripped that bear with his bare hands. Now David in the natural, he was just a little boy that was ruddy looking, maybe a skinny little boy. He could not have killed that bear. But because he had God with him, he did it by the strength of Almighty God. Okay, the bear was fine. He destroyed the bear. He saved the little lamb. Then the lion comes. The king of the jungle comes. And do you think David was scared for the lion? No, he was not scared. The same God that delivered him from the bear, he was able to wrestle with that lion and he ripped that lion apart and saved his little sheep as well. So by the time he had to face Goliath, David was pumped up with confidence. He had so much of confidence that when Goliath came for 40 days, every day he struck up his ugly head and he said, is there anyone there that come, can come and fight me? And none of them, when King Saul's men and even David's big brothers would see Goliath, they would turn their backs and run. But little David, when he looked at that Goliath, he walked, he walked forward full of power, full of might, because he had confidence in the God that he served. And he, and he looked at this giant, no matter how big or how tall this giant was, his confidence was not in the sight of this big giant. He said, the same God that delivered me from the lions, from the paw of the bear and from the jaw of the lion, is the same God that will deliver me from you, Goliath. You that, that uh, demean my holy God. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. And he went forth. And if people say, oh, David came with his, with his sling and his stones. It was not the sling and the stones that killed Goliath. It was the power behind that stone. And that was Almighty God. He, the, the, the Holy Ghost would have went behind that stone and knocked Goliath right in the middle of his forehead, struck him down dead. Now that is the same God that you and I serve. What a mighty and awesome God. You know, the Bible tells me, that in Isaiah 40 verse 12, he is such a big and mighty God. Someone, I heard a preacher say that God is just the size of a man. He has a six, six inch hand. Now you tell me, if you have a six inch hand like a normal man, how can you hold the waters of this universe in your one hand? My Bible tells me in Isaiah 40 verse 12, he holds the waters of this universe in his one hand. Now can you imagine what a big hand that is? That he holds a water. I mean, look at this lake. It's massive. This lake is so tiny compared to God's hand. Then we got all the oceans. We got all the seas. We got the rivers. We got all the lakes in this whole world. My God holds it in his one hand. I mean, I, I tried it. When I read that scripture, I went into the bathroom and I said, let's see how much water I can hold. I mean, my hand is so small, I couldn't hold much. Then I thought of this enormous God that I serve. 
that the waters of this universe can fit in his one hand. And more than that, he, he say, the scripture says that he meted out the heavens in a span. Now the span is, is a measurement between your thumb and your little finger. That is a span. Now, can you imagine he meted out the heavens in a span? What a big God this is. And he meted out the dust of the measure. Anything that you could hold between, it's like a pinch, you know, a pinch of salt, a pinch of this. Anything you can hold between these three fingers is, as, uh, meet, uh, is a measure, a measure of salt, a measure of barley. Now this is how big he meted the dust of the earth. Now you and I are created from dust. So all the whole population of this whole world, God can pick it up with his two fingers and his thumb. Can you imagine? I cannot fathom this big God. I cannot, I try to imagine, I just cannot fathom how big this God is. But he is mighty. He's so awesome. And more than that, you think about it, when he created heaven and earth, he just did it. By his spoken word, he said, let there be light, and there was light. Let there be this, and everything was, whatever he said came into being. Now what a mighty, what an awesome, what a powerful God you and I serve. Now, I, I related to you the story of Saul, but that's not just one isolated incident in the Bible. You look at the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua talks about how God or God used Joshua and 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 he defeated the the peop, the the armies of AI God didn't take all the people of Israel he just took 3000 or was it 300 that defeated the people of AI and then they were they were on their way and then the 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 people of AI came back to attack them and there were 3,000 in, in the group with, with uh, Joshua. And from the 36 of them were, were killed by the soldiers of, a, of, of AI. And, and it troubled Joshua. And Joshua asked God, why God? When we were so few in number, 300 of us, we could destroy this whole army of them. But now we are much more than them and they're destroying us. And God said, go and examine your people. And, and Joshua went to everyone's tent and he asked them and he came to Achan and he asked Achan, what have you done? And, and God gave them the same commandment, do not take anything, do not take any spoils, kill everything and do not take any spoil. When he come to Achan's tent, what does he say? This, I've got 200 shekels of silver and I've got a gold wedge weighing 50 shekels and I've got a Babylonian garment. God said, do not touch, do not take anything. And yea, he rebelled against God's word. And what happened to Achan? He was destroyed. Not only did Achan, but his family and all his possessions, they were stoned to death and everything was burnt. And that was not the only case. Look at Samson. Samson was chosen from God from his mother's womb. His mother was not allowed to touch any strong drink or any wine or uh, anything, even not eat any, sorry, not cut his hair as well. And she wasn't even allowed to eat raisins because he was anointed from his mother's womb. But as Samson grew up, the things of this world, like the scripture says, the things of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choked the word. And what did Samuel do? He looked at women and he started lusting after them and he fell into sin. And he went against God's word again. And the wages of sin is death. And Sam Samson as well. His eyes were gouged out. And he, and he died a pitiful death. You know the story of Samson. But today God is standing within us and he says, I lay before you life and death. And it's up to you today. I'm doing the same today. I shared with you today what this big and mighty and awesome God can do. And he's telling you today, I lay before you life and death. It's up to you. You choose. And he says that. I said, I recommend you choose life. And I'm telling you the same. I, I recommend you choose life. And if you have unsaved family members, 
you have unsaved children or unsaved grandchildren, the ball's in your court today. You know what you can do. And it's everything to do with God's word. We honor God's word. And he said, if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we and our household shall be saved. So everyone in your household, your children, your grandchildren, and, and the ge generations to follow, they all can be saved. But it's up to you today. You choose life. And I just want to give God all the thanks and all the praise and the glory that he has kept me for 29 years so that I can have this privilege of meeting with you lovely people today. And I just want to praise him and, and just thank him because he's a, he's, I cannot stop saying how good God has been in our lives. In every area of our lives, he's been a good God. And tomorrow when I share with you again, I'm going to share with you that he is a God of abundance. This, the, the thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come to give life and life more abundance. And I'm going to share with you tomorrow about this abundant life that all of us can have in Christ Jesus. And um, to God be the glory for great things he has done. Amen.